Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and we're so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful team behind Netflix's Witcher. We're joined by Lauren Schmidt Hisrich, who is the executive producer and showrunner, as well as cast members Freya Allen, Anya Chalotra, and Mimi Kaisa. And I wanted to start with you, Lauren, by talking a little bit about the writing process on the show, because you've spoken about how one of the things, no matter what TV show it is that you're working on, that part of that process is actually taking a look and, and re-watching the season before um, and really paying attention to the minutiae of the character strands, the narrative arcs. And I was interested for this show in how looking back at the first season and really paying attention to those details informed a lot of the foundation that you really wanted to build upon story-wise. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think part of the creative process is looking at what you've done and being really honest in your gut about what works and what doesn't. And you have to separate yourself out from your pride, from defensiveness, from just, you know, that sense of stubbornness of I wanted it this way, so it's going to work. Um, what was really interesting is we had written season two by the time season one came out. So we kind of had to learn those lessons retroactively. And this is where um, our COVID shutdown was a little bit of a silver lining for the creative process, because we had a five month break that we were able to reflect back on the scripts of season two as a whole. And by that point, the show had aired. I um, am probably a little uh, too involved on social media and <laughs> fan, you know, I always want to know what the fans are thinking. Um, but I did try to take those lessons into season two and as did the rest of the writers. Um, and then also, you know, not just um, what showed up on screen, but also talking to our actors, talking to our crew, what worked for them, what didn't work for them. It's just a constantly evolving and organic process to, to, to improve the material every season. And then jumping over to you, Freya, and talking about Siri, um, I wanted to talk about the really unique relationship and dynamic that you formed with Henry when it comes to Siri and Geralt, because they're in this space where they've both had this destiny towards one another. And so there's a real kinetic energy and connection. And again, at the same time, when they first cross paths with one another, they are strangers and they are really getting to know each other for the first time. And I was really interested in how you found the dichotomy of those two spaces within their chemistry and within that very unique relationship relationship they have with one another. I mean, I think she comes into season two, uh, you know, carrying the weight of everything she experienced in season one. So she got to see the brutality of the continent and how people can be and how, you know, you can't really trust anyone. People, people will let you down. And so I think as a result of that, she therefore, you know, she has a, this sort of immediate guard up. And um, she's also unwilling to open up because she's afraid of what she's having to open up about, i.e. her powers, her past, and, you know, what she's done. And so I think that puts an immediate kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's an immediate kind of halt for their relationship to move forward. Um, but you do see like glimmers throughout that kind of friction that they have between one another, where they are begin. you are beginning to see her trust and, and, and um, have moments of opening up in, in some way, shape or form. There's also that, that dynamic they have to deal with of having that push and pull kind of relationship um, in terms of the fact that Siri wants to become a witcher and become a great fighter and that means a great deal to her because it's even more than just the fighting for her it's an escape and um, that doesn't align with Geralt's you know um, ideas he, he his priority is to protect this girl and so it's about them you know working out and understanding each other's sides of it and you know for Siri she wants to be more than just a princess to protect you know she wants to make something of herself in in some way and and she wants to have a choice in her future rather than it just being dictated by this sort of need to be um hidden from everyone um so yeah it's they 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 have to work through all of that and I think from those moments where they have that sort of like knocking of heads, they actually um, end up building a lot of trust with one another. And you really see towards the end of the season that Siri really cares for him. Anya, one of the things about Yennefer and her backstory is that she's had to build up so many walls around herself in a real protective way. But I was actually interested in the way in which you also play that as a strength to her as a character, because there's also moments where she's really able to use that protectiveness as an asset to herself as well and really process everything that's going on around her. Yeah, I mean, in this world, you kind of can't trust anyone. Uh, I think everyone's, uh, you know, created walls around them um, to help them kind of face the brutality and the violence of this world. 
So yeah, she definitely has become the Yennefer we know and love from the books. You know, that's kind of cold hearted, stony faced woman who can take on anything and is one of the most powerful sorceresses on the continent until you come along. But um, yeah, it, you know, she's uh, definitely guarded. What I love about this season is that we get to see what's behind all that. And Mimi, within your performance, I love the way that you play this character in a way where, you know, she has no qualms about seeding her inner strength and her inner power. And yet you also always ensure that you're servicing the vulnerability within her um, and was interested in performance wise. And when you first shaped her as a character, how you always make sure that you're servicing both of those sides in conjunction with one another. I think that kind of contrast is true to real life. Mm -hmm. um, I think with Fingella, she, she takes so much from what she sees around her and what she sees in other people. But that doesn't mean that she sees herself as clearly. And so she's constantly, I feel, wavering this line between her true desire, how to get there, and the gap between who she is now and who she wants to be. Um, I find that really great to play. I love it. And then Lauren, jumping back to the scope of the writing, there's actually something that you said about this show in which to a degree, you also view it as a workplace drama, you know, and especially looking back to some of the other shows that you've worked on, you know, if you look at Henry's character, you know, it's pure dedication to his job. Everything about that is about striving within his workplace. Um, and I was interested in how that shapes the scope and the way that you see this show and the way that you develop some of the aspects story-wise. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think like any any good drama, you start with uh, sort of who people are, what they're passionate about, what their own individual stories were. And that to me was really the basis of season one. Um, Yennefer, Geralt and Ciri are all in their own kind of silos to an extent. And you don't get to know them by interacting with other people. You get to know them in terms of their profession. What is a mage? What is a witcher? What is a princess of, of Sintra doing? Um, and this season, it's like, you know, season four of a good workplace drama, you start to actually get into more of their interactions with each other, but also their pasts are coming into fruition um, in this season. And I think, you know, you were asking Anya about, about struggles earlier and sort of the struggles that characters are facing. And I think one of the things that we did this season is we took a lot of those struggles from external to internal. You know, in season one, all of these characters are sort of fighting, um, fighting against other forces, you know, forces from beyond them. And when you were just talking to Mimi about Fringilla, I think Fringilla's storyline this season, it becomes so internal because how, do, how is she saying true to what she decided is her path, which is to serve the white flame, to do everything she can. Um, but also she's got this new and beautiful friendship um, with Francesca and it completely changes the way that she sees herself at work, if you will, which is that suddenly, and this is an aside, I think so often women in in all sorts of media are, are pitted against each other. And it feels like, obviously, if two women are, are both striving for positions of power, they must be competitive. And what I loved about the Fringilla Francesca storyline this season is there's this, this beautiful moment where they discover that they're partners and they like that. Um, and it completely changed the direction of Fringilla's story. So, you know, I do think we're, we're constantly in terms of the workplace of it all. We now have these people's jobs, we're getting them together and we're starting to see how they bounce off of each other and who they are individually is impacting who they are as a group. And off the back of that, Mimi, I wanted to come back to you and talking about the way in which your character having that moment of discovery where she really loves this partnership that's forming, how that for you opened up different landscapes and different spaces within her as a character to explore. I think what was really beautiful this season is what happens when Fringilla is met with someone who potentially brings out the best in her and we never get a chance to truly settle in that. It's always slightly temperamental and it could go at any moment. And she feels that, she definitely feels that. And as we go through the season, we see her processing that against what is required of her. Um, I'm excited for you to see that process because I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Jumping back to you, Anya, I wanted to talk about Yennefer in terms of her relationship to her physical self as a character, because, you know, her body is the reason that she was so rejected in the past and rejected by her family, and now is a, a place that she has learned to pull a lot of power from. And obviously, in the, in the second season, she's going through that relationship within her physical self and the loss of pa that power and what that means to her as well. And so I was interested for you in how she's had such an exploration of what her relationship with her physical self and her version of power seeded from herself is um yeah i mean i think what she demonstrated at the battle of Sutton in season one she realized through all of the kind of transformation that she'd been through her power was actually innate um i thought and then come season two and you, she's uh, been stripped of something that has defined her she realizes that oh she she's got to dig deeper and um really find her true source of power and the like i said the meeting she has um kind of meeting siri as well changes her for the better uh, her purpose shifts for sure to a more powerful selfless purpose and then Freya, with Siri going through all of the training where she wants to learn everything that witches do, you know, she's pitted into this space where she almost feels like no matter how much she does, it's just never quite enough and she's almost succeeding. But there's the moments where she's doing the American Ninja Warrior style course and she almost gets there but doesn't. And I was interested in how you approach those scenes because there's so much in terms of your physical performance, but also a lot of internalized moments where you're really capturing that fortitude and determination that she has. Yeah, I think she just always has that um, in her, that kind of uh, determination to prove people wrong. Because I feel like having come from, you know, being a princess, you, she's kind of constantly wanting to and having to do that, prove that she, she can be more than just a princess and boxed into this sort of stereotypical kind of idea of a, of a princess she wants to be more than that and she's a character who she's someone who you know um recognizes that she has choice and that that belongs to her and she can do what she wants with that so um you know when she gets the chance to prove to lambert and cohen that she can uh, conquer the obstacle course um i think that's you know that's immediately you know it's it's them and their doubt in her and their sort of um yeah, they're doubting her that sort of is the catalyst for her uh, her determination throughout the course. And um, I think her frustration post it is obviously very natural. I mean, she was so close to perfecting it. Um, and, you know, she's, she also not only wants to prove them wrong, she wants to prove Geralt to Geralt that, you know, she can do this and um, give him a reason to to actually believe and to, and to be a force behind what she views as her future, which is becoming a great fighter and becoming a witcher, because, you know, that was a big, um, you know, thing that they're having to navigate in their relationship is the fact that he just wants to protect her. And um, she's trying to say, you know, through this kind of um, training and um, eventually, you know, uh, vote you know vocalizes it to him as well that she wants to be more than that she doesn't want to just be this girl to be protected she needs to also live so um yeah there's there's all that running behind all those training moments um, I wanted to talk about the physicality and where you find your performances with your characters when they are seeding their power, because there's so many different dynamics and spaces and emotional landscapes that it comes from whenever they are kind of harnessing that. And so I was interested in when you first jumped into the show, the spaces that you played around with the, phys with the physicality of your performance in those regards. You know, I feel like Freya hit the nail on the head there. We're given such great material. And so I try my best not to layer it with too much of myself. I just sort of take what we're given and then I, I try and find that in the scene with my scene partner. And so much of Fringilla's process this, this season is about her internally working things out. It's about her internal struggle. It's about her utilizing her relationships or not um, and seeing where those things get her. And, and that's, that's it's all in the page for us. And, and we do, we discover it. Um, as we go and sometimes I, I remember 
I would have an idea in my, my head of what I think a scene may look like for her, where I think she needs to leave a scene emotionally. And that would never go as planned. So I learned to sort of let that go really quickly. Has that been a similar trajectory for you, Anya? Because again, you've had so many great moments to play around with and even just the physical manifestation of the season one finale and that moment for her as a character. Yeah, I mean, um, I try not to, uh, the best advice I ever got from a mentor um, four months into filming season one, I was called her up, Neve Kazak, and she, um, and I, it's like, oh gosh, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> she said, um, just play the scene. Like, that's all you can do. Play the scene, um, play the stakes of the scene. Don't think too much about it. Don't cerebralize anything. Um, and that is how I kind of need to go into each season of The Witcher because it's a mammoth kind of task to, to film over a period of um, six to eight, to a year and a half <laughs> um, um, worth of, you know, a period. So it's, you know, we don't necessarily shoot in consecutive order. So it's really important to just be present, I think. And I think that's the yeah. best advice I, I, I've ever been given. Yes, um, so when, even though when it comes to physicality, kind of mental prep, you know, it, you try and leave everything at the door and come in and do your job professionally. But it's, it's, quite, it's been hard through COVID. You know, there's been so much um, angst on set where people disguise it so kind of well because we've had to deal with it for so long. It's important to just go in present, I think. I mean, that presents its challenges as well, but um, best advice. And was that a similar journey in terms of the physicality of your performance when you were playing those those kind of early scenes within Yennefer's life where you had the prosthetic kind of hump on your back and her jaw was misaligned and really figuring out what the nuances of that needed to be? Because that was about both the physicality, but also the emotional impact that that has on her as a character. Yes. Um... We came up with that movement quite quickly. Um, so I think both informed each other, both, you know, you, I had to on season two and one, just trust my instinct. There was no room for doubt, really. Um, I had to believe what I was doing to kind of hopefully make that translate on screen. And um, so, Again, when it came to the physicality and the, the, the kind of emotional state of the young Yennefer with all the trauma she has to deal with, um, it, was, it, was, it was about trusting an instinct of mine. And I work from movement anyway. Um, there are kind of, uh, I suppose, with more prep, there could have been different ways of exploring that movement. Um, but that's what I went with and you know trusting trusting your instinct is kind of something I live by when I when I film and then Lauren I wanted to jump back to some of your trajectory and your relationship that you've had within this material because um, you spoke extensively after the first season about how your initial interpretation of a lot of fantasy and, and kind of sci-fi writing was that for the audience engagement it was very much about the escapism and that actually there was a real alteration in realizing that it's actually about finding those familiarities to everyday life and I think that that really carries through into the way that you've written this show and the way that these characters connect with people because there are so many relatable elements, even going back to what you were saying before about the workplace dynamics and how that's relatable elements to everyone. And how has that informed the type of connection that you try to write to for audiences? Um, I think that's absolutely right. You know, I think that all fantasy is a lens for our reality. And what's interesting is I think when Sapkowski wrote these novels in the 80s, when he started writing the 80s, he probably assumed that he was writing a lens to current problems um, that Eastern Europe was experiencing. And of course, you know, we are 40 years later and we are still experiencing the same levels of racism and xenophobia and sexism. So it's not hard I will say to write something that has to reflect our real life because um, those aspects are just present in our world as sad as it is. What I will say this season, the thing that I could not have anticipated of course was um, a, a global pandemic. And what was really interesting was so many of these stories, you know, when I was speaking earlier about internal struggle, you know, Frey and I talked very early, you know, on about like the sense of, is there a monster inside Siri? Like Siri feels like a monster. And so how does she start to um, come to terms with this power that she has? She has killed people, which she's not confessed to anyone. And she feels um, 
so much guilt and grief over what she's experiencing and cannot control. And we come back from this pandemic and, and Anya, you, you sort of alluded to this. We're on set suddenly after being isolated in our own homes for six, eight months. We're on set. There's 400 people around. Um, obviously, we're taking every precaution necessary, but suddenly we're looking at other humans as um, dangerous. So it, there's this sense of you never know if you're going to get sick, what's going to happen. You know, you obviously can't touch each other anymore. And I think that we all brought back this slight sense of, um, of trepidation. And I think that plays both on the page and on the screen, which is everyone is a little afraid of being vulnerable this season. And I think what's amazing, even though we shot wildly out of order, but we did shoot the finale toward the end. And I think for all of these women and their characters, this is the time in the story where they started to realize that vulnerability was the only way forward to open up, to um, be more in touch with not just what they're feeling, but to share that with someone else and to have that interaction. And I think that very much matches where we were all at in the world, um, realizing that we were really missing that sort of interaction and human connection again. And then Mimi with Fring Fringella, there's such a deliberate delivery to the way that she uses language and even just the rhythm of the way that she speaks. And sometimes she'll kind of hold the words a little bit. And with your experience, particularly looking at your experience on stage and with the Royal Shakespeare Company and the fact that you've worked on so many projects where there's so many specific nuances to language, I was really interested in, in how you take the text and really work with kind of finding those rich layers and that rhythm and those very particular beats within it. I, if I'm honest, I don't, um... I try my best not to think about it too technically. And I do that because I genuinely trust the text and the text is written in particular rhythms. Um, and then when you're with, with your, your other actors, you'll explore different avenues. You know, we spent so, so much time between just running the same like couple of lines to each other. Um, and even, you know, pre-pandemic with Anya, we would sit in our little like nuances with each other and work out actually is it strong if we say it like that and does it does the right message come across if we do it like that and we just discover and I think because this is so driven by the relationships that these characters make um you have to rely on the people that you're with and the text that you're given I don't think there's any other way to do it um so that's my process Freya, going back to Siri and part of her, her arc within this season, there's a moment where she kind of finds out that she potentially has the ability to do something which would heal other people around her and really have a huge impact. And yet it's a huge risk to herself. And, and as a character, it very frequently feels like she's someone who isn't just thinking about the outcome for herself, but also the implications for others around her. And is that something that's always been a really important trait and really important characteristic for you to carry through within her and her interpersonal dynamics? I mean, I just think it's an automatic response to um, uh, her, this power that she has in terms of the fact that she you know we've seen that she doesn't have control over it and has ended up killing people without you know uh having the control over that you know without meaning to intending to and i think you know when she's thrown into um you know uh, becoming uh, ending up caring for someone i.e Geralt or the witches um the rest of the witches um i think that is obviously her greatest fear is the thought that she could harm the people that she loves the most. Um, and she she recognizes, you know, she has that line at the end of episode one where she says, um, you know, everywhere I go, people, people seem to die. And I think she has this idea in her head that she sort of is almost like this unlucky charm. And, um, and so I think, yeah, her greatest, you know, fear surrounding her power is the, the idea that she can't control it and that she could, uh, explode in, in any moment and actually I remember often carrying that through into scenes you know where there's some kind of you know tension between her and Geralt um, or she's frustrated at something that she always has in the back of her mind that she can't lose it she can't let go fully and be completely you know get, get angry because she's constantly living with this you know on, on a on a zip wire of like if i if i ex if, if i explode what's going to happen like am i going to harm someone so yeah it's it's constantly with her and it sort of is like a bit of a um it, yeah 
it's it's like a, a bit of a nightmare for her. And Anya, with, with Yennefer, there's something really great that you said where you love the aspect of her as a character that she has so many unpredictable actions and choices. Um, and when you're working on scenes and trying to figure out all the different directions that you could possibly take a choice or take an emotional response to something, does that really open up the possibilities for you and a lot of the different choices that you can look at as potential directions and avenues? Yeah, I mean, testament to the writing, uh, that kind of with the end's journey and um, and who kind of what we're creating with Yennefer, we're able to really explore every side of her. We know and kind of love this presence she has, this magnetism. And what's interesting is that even when she's up against Geralt this season, what does that look like now she's kind of not... Um, she hasn't got the, she, she's been stripped of something that's so um, defining. What, what, what who, who is she now? Where, what route does she go down? I mean, she's a human being and we've got the capacity for so much. Um, the kind of, we, you know, we've all got a monster in us. We've all got, there's so many directions we could go in. It's about the choices you make. And that's why I think it's so clever this season with all the meetings that these characters have to, to put them in front of their enemy and go right here you go and you know how are we how do we navigate this world that's getting even more brutal and violent and the threats even more kind of upon us this this elf uh, the the elf story that we have in this season as well that through line is incredibly important to, to Yennefer's journey as well this season um and adds an, yet another layer to the continent and Lauren, one of the other things that you've spoken about in, in terms of the writing process as well is that, you know, you're you're writing this show and you're creating a series for Netflix where there is that flexibility, in essence, to really play around with episode length and have moments where a certain narrative arc goes on a little bit more and you spend a little bit more time with it. But that for you, you actually like to really keep that story tight and kind of keep to that hour. Um, and do you find that there are aspects of the creative process where if you create limitations for yourself, that that actually really enhances the process for you oh absolutely i mean my my whole uh job has to be about limitations i so um despise this idea that like magic is found creative magic is found in chaos mm -hmm. magic that that we create here all of us is found in planning and schedules and having scripts ahead of time, being able to prep the material, being able to, you know, I, I'm so appreciative that all these women are talking about the scripts, but truly part of that process is all of us sitting down and working through it. Um, if something isn't working, you know, what I love about specifically, see, I can just turn this into a love fest because I could work with these women all day long. Um, <laughs> what I love too, there's been so much conversation about scene partners. And I think that, you know, uh, so many actors um, will come to me immediately and say like, I've got a problem with this. And what I have learned that works really beautifully on The Witcher is that people sit down with their scene partners. They talk about it first. They figure out the dynamics of the scene. If there still is an issue of understanding sort of where a character is going or why a character is making a certain decision, then they come back to me. Um, and then we have sort of larger conversations and we figure out a way to make it work. Collaboration is the key to this. But you can't do that unless you're planning. So for me, so much of my job is about boundaries. I think I grew up in network television where episodes were exactly 42 minutes long, not less, not more. Um, I personally find that if I'm watching a show, if it is, you know, an hour and 12 seconds long, I'm like, Ugh, over an hour, I got to go to bed. If it's 59 minutes and 57 seconds, I will watch it. So, you know, it's just keeping all of those things in mind. I just think that <laughs> boundaries are what keep us safe. No, boundaries are, are what allow us to pour our energy into the right things, um, the creative things, and not necessarily into, um, you know, chaos. Yeah. And for all of the cast, because it does sound like it is such a collaborative environment and a really open space to have a lot of those creative discussions when it comes to character. Um, I was interested in in that evolution and that shift in the way in which the types of conversations that you're having with Lauren, with the directors on the show, with the rest of the creative team has really evolved coming into the second season because the first season was very much about who are these characters, how are we going to play them? And the second season is very much about taking the foundation of, of who you've already built out and that 
relationship that you have from inhabiting them and then really figuring out how to add new layers to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I loved it. I, um, that was, that's something that I am so grateful for on this job is just the opportunity and the respect to kind of listen to our, you know, points or concerns. And it really is, they, you know, we really are listened to and we really do just like problem solve together. And if that's what makes it feel like we're a team rather than there being sort of different positions, we're all in it like as a group. And, um, I think for me, going from season one to season two, obviously in season one, as we've discussed, there was an awful lot of um, running and <laughs> like less so me having to really like engage, you know, for a long amount of period of time with another person in a scene. And so getting to do that so much this season was just like amazing. And um, and there was almost always you know, for, for so many scenes, always just so much to discuss because there is so much going on all the time now that she's having, now that Siri, you know, is having to sit with everything and work herself out and work on her out. And so um, to do that with like all the actors I've got to work with was just so much fun and I absorbed and learnt off everyone. And um, yeah, it's, that's the, that's what I love so much about getting to work is just getting to work opposite other actors and, and, and absorb everything that they're doing and yeah. And what about for the other two of you? Yeah, it's, I mean, sometimes you think you know it all because you've played them for the first season, but you come on and just introducing so many new characters new direct directors for each block kind of changing the pace of the witcher changing your thought process for the better adding more voices to this incredible family that we've already created just brings so much depth without even consciously thinking about the changes you're making you're making them and i think that's the uh, kind of the lovely uh, thing about the witcher and sophie's done an incredible job to to bring on uh, this is an essence of everyone in the family that's quite similar, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, everyone just cu comes in and is their character and fits so beautifully into mm. this into this world. Um, constantly surprised, uh, constantly challenged. Yeah, it's cool because so many of the dynamics off screen between us as as ourselves is honestly so similar to the dynamic on screen. So it's like you're constantly just transferring elements of a very sort of like natural energy just into, you know, our, our characters exactly. and the situations they're in. It's, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. I and remember I one, of the, yeah. um, one of the first ever conversations, I think it was the first conversation actually that I ever had with you, Lauren. I remember you saying to me, no divas here. And then you go from season one um, where you do feel this sense of unity, but obviously it's season one and, and part of your process as an actor is, you know, you're working out the baby steps even for your character. And as the world and the continent expands in season two, you realise actually this is an environment where every perspective is genuinely welcome. And with that comes a richness. Um, and as we get new dynamics like the elves and things and, and new um, actors in that, in that environment, as well as new creatives, you're just constantly building and building. And you don't realise it until you look back and you'll look at it and be like, oh my gosh, guys, has this been a three-year process? It feels like 10. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of it, that you look back and go, oh, I'm proud of us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> definitely a sense of that at the end of this season my goodness oh yeah I bawled my eyes out I, did. I was an absolute wreck and it was more for everyone else it's like you've done it <laughs> well done <laughs> Has it also really um, shifted the way in which you come in and work on scenes together as actors as well in the fact that, again, you're coming in and you kind of have this secondhand idea of not only your character, but the characters that you're playing alongside and each other as actors and the way that you stylistically all work. And, you know, because everybody always comes in with their own dynamic and their own way of working as a performer. And then you form this kind of collaborative, very unique style within a show as well. I mean, I think, you know, just, I can't obviously speak as a performer, um, but, you know, I do think that it has shifted so much. It, 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 Mimi's right. I, from day one to everyone I met, every single level, all actors, the crew, 
Um, I think I use not as pleasant a word as diva. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I really feel like I, um, uh, these women know I'm on set every single day. I'm always there. I've, I work really hard. I want everyone else to work really hard too. But more importantly than that, we're all away from our families. We're all spending so many hours there. So let's make it an enjoyable place to work. And I think too, um, I think season one for me was a lot about facilitating conversations, making sure that, that actors were comfortable with their scene partners and you can reach out. And I didn't have to do any of that in, in season two, because those relationships are established already. And I, there is nothing better than when I would come in, you know, with my coffee in the morning um, to our Care More and Great Hall, and Freya would be sitting with Kim Vodnia, and they would have gone through the scene, they'd be laughing and cracking up, and they would have already figured it out. And I just think, like, the intimacy that we're all talking about, that sense of family, um, which is not to say, by the way, that there aren't problems and drama and bad days, like, those all exist. But that real sense of intimacy that you have allows people to feel comfortable and vulnerable with each other. And it's, I think it's all on screen this season. I think that you see a new confidence in the show. Um, uh, certainly from my part, from the writing perspective, I think the show is a lot more confident in what it is. But I think the performances are a lot more confident as well. And it's just, I think that's why people are really liking it this season. Yeah, completely agree. And then Lauren, I also wanted to talk about the fact that you know, you've got such an amazingly extensive background and experience in working within television, but this is your first project coming on board as a showrunner. And what were those kind of evolutions and, and learning curves? Because there's so much that you've obviously seen firsthand with the showrunners that you've worked alongside on all of these projects. And yet there's always elements and aspects of the job that you just kind of don't know or can't experience until you're actually the person doing it. And so I was interested what those aspects were and what those learning curves were for you in taking over Witcher. Um, they were great. I mean, I, I started in television when I was 20 years old and I started on The Witcher when I was 39. Um, and it absolutely was my first show that I'd ever run. And it wasn't a small one. I was not, um, it was definitely sort of a baptism uh, by fire. I think um, my evolution has been a really personal one, which is that at the beginning, I think both because it was my first time as a showrunner, because it was such a big show, and frankly, because I was a woman in a field that I think is not just traditionally male in terms of showrunners, but also in the fantasy world, it's traditionally a genre that is led by men. Um, I felt like I had to do a lot to prove myself. And um, uh, looking back, I, like, I just want to hold myself and give myself a big hug because it was, I thought that the way to prove myself was to do everything and to be there 24 seven. Um, I barely saw my children that year. You know, it was, um, it really was a lot to sort of say like, no, I belong here. I can do this. And what really shifted in season two was my, uh, my understanding that one, I didn't have to work so hard to prove myself. I was there, I was doing the job and the show was good and people were happy. Um, but even more than that, that by trying to do everything myself, I wasn't letting other people um, shine in, in their jobs. And so starting season two, I really took on this mantra of like hire people I trust and then trust them and then trust them to do their jobs. Um, and that I think is part of the overall shift in season two is because we have an amazing creative team and they all got to own their own creative parts of it. Um, and this is everyone from, you know, actors to directors to, you know, production design and costume. Um, people really got to shine. And for me, that meant less micromanaging and more sanity and space for me to be okay too. And it, it's, it has changed everything. I think it's changed the show, but more than that, it's changed my life and, and the quality of my life. And then lastly, I'm going to come to each of you within the cast, because this feels like a show where it's really giving you so many opportunities to stretch as actors and to go into a lot of spaces for the very first time in terms of the landscape of what the show asks of you. Um, and I was interested for each of you in terms of the confidence that you've kind of developed within yourself or found within yourself as actors from the things that you've learned on working on this project over two seasons, particularly with the amount of time that you've had to inhabit these characters now. And Mimi, I'm gonna to come to you first. Um, you know, with acting, as an actor, the, the sort of bond that you create with your personal character, sometimes the line, you can't work it out where it is anymore. 
And so your character and the environment that you're in so much will feed your life, you know, your everyday reality. And, you know, just as Lauren was talking about her own personal experience and how season one and season two have influenced, you know, how, how she makes those distinctions with her life. I felt that a lot too. And I feel like we all had this monumental pause button with lockdown where everyone in the world was forced to just stop for a second and rethink about what are we doing? You know, what are we individually doing as well as what is the world doing? And in that time, we were mid-shoot. So Anya and I had already started our block one and we were about to go into um, the next block once the world opened again. And whilst I was working on Fingilla's text about her process, her whys, her hows, how does she get from who she is to who does she want to be? I was also thinking about that as me, Mimi. And her having to make bold decisions made me question, why am I not making bold decisions? Um, and so they do kind of work in tandem, particularly when you're on a long series and, and you're spending so much time biting into who the core of that character is. I hope that answered your question. It wasn't just a little therapy stop. <laughs> Answered it beautifully, and I'm going to come to you next, Freya. Um, post season one, you know, I I I got the job when I was 16, and um, I was always growing up very happy to stay young. I mean, you know, mentally keep <laughs> mature, hopefully, but like I was happy. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was happy to stay a child rather than become a woman, right? And that's when I started the job. And then I think, you know, you're around grown uh, adults. Uh, the whole time and grown ups and um, that's how I felt anyway I just got out come out of school so it felt yeah like that and um, I think sort of midway through the season I suddenly sort of like decides started feeling like a lot older and um, more embracing that I was like becoming a woman and then I think once season one was shot I went through a bit of a like the opposite of confidence I didn't feel very confident I felt very anxious about it coming out because you know, I was essentially like, you know, growing up um, with something that presented me very much like a child, but I was growing into myself as a woman. So I was sort of confused by that and, and didn't feel very comfortable with it. Um, but then I think after shooting season um, two of The Witcher, similarly to Siri, it's very much paralleling, um, uh, you know, my life with hers in a way, I sort of started finding a lot of strength from playing her that season um, and uh, actually like, you know, um, you know, loved the way that she was written in the scripts. And um, and so I think now post, you know, filming season two, I, I really do carry the fact that I'm a part of this show and I get to play Siri and go on, take her on this journey. Um, definitely carry that with me subconsciously through daily life, just because it's something I'm proud of and um, uh, something that, you know, no one can really take that away from you. You've always got that with you, you know, kind of somewhere in you as cheesy as that sounds. Um, but yeah, I think I think so. So now I do. It's made me feel a lot more confident. But there's there was a wave of it. I really love that that journey and that arc. And lastly, for you, Anya. Oh, um, kind of just to echo what the girls have said. Really, um, I've learned a hell of a lot. And like what Laura was saying about baptism by fire, I feel like I that was shown on screen for me that was uh, you know I, I was I felt I was like I was thrown into it on screen you know you take that opportunity you run with it and there was so much of um kind of Yennefer that was shown and therefore me um in terms of her kind of emotional state um the age she plays you know she goes from 14 to, to kind of someone in her 70s so yeah, there was a, there was a lot there, and I learned from the people around me the scale of the show, where I lived for eight months. Um, yeah, I, and then the COVID hit, and gosh, the, you just get your priorities in order. Um, some day, some days better than others, um, but you you just gain perspective. And I went into this season like less feeling less pressure 
kind of lowering the expectation on everything um, uh, with everything I'd learned that year. And yeah, I mean, it, Yennef has informed a lot of who I am and uh, kind of vice versa. And just so glad to be on this journey. Well, I think season two is is such a phenomenal accomplishment from everything that you've all done. And it's been such a pleasure watching it. I know audiences are going to connect to it just as much as they did with the first. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.